Hey, good morning, Jeff Wu here. And today we're gonna dive into some more business reaction videos. So my personal most viral pieces of content has been me reacting towards some of the most idiotic or most genius business content out there. So I'm gonna turn this into a regular series. If you like this content, please like, subscribe, comment, and also send me videos that you want me to respond to. Let's get into it. Best advice you ever received. A man named Rich told me once in Diamond Bar, I'm in the corner, I'm looking at everybody. Everybody's having dinner and they're at these tables. I pull Rich aside, I said, Rich, give me the one best advice. I want one above everything. And he said, look at everybody here. They're all gonna read just a few books and learn a few quotes, a few titles, a few stories to tell from the books they read. And once they make a hundred quarter million, they're gonna slow down. If you keep out improving these guys consistently, eventually none of these guys will be your competitors. And he was absolutely right. I took self-improvement to a whole different level based on what he told me. It became an obsession. And I noticed, you know what? He was right. I really like Patrick Bet David. To me, he's really just blown up in the last year or two. I'm just looking at his Wikipedia page here, and he started his YouTube channel in 2012. So he's been grinding on the content game for 12 plus years in relative mediocrity, relative obscurity. And within the last one or two years, he's finally broken through. I think what's cool about Patrick is that when he's talking about self-improvement, that obsession to constantly compound and self-improve, he has a lot of authenticity to me because he lives it. He's been powering through 12 years of obscurity to finally break through today. But the unspoken thing that people like Patrick and people that are actually successful that they don't talk about, and I empathize with a lot of this, is that it's not enough. I think we all have psychological trauma, whether that we weren't loved as children or we're seeking approval from our peers. We just want more. So I think a very normal person is making 100, 250K a year. Great money. You can live a very comfortable, middle-class lifestyle, raise a family, beautiful. For someone like, for Patrick, or frankly me, it's not enough. I want more. I wanna make a million dollars a year. I wanna make $10 million a year. I wanna make $100 million a year. People like Elon Musk have built trillions of dollars of market cap, and they want more. There is some demon in a few of us that just wants more, just to prove something to ourselves, or prove something to our fathers, our friends, or someone that beat us up when we're kids. To me, it's about understanding and harnessing that psychological trauma, that personality trait. A recent conversation I had with one of the biggest global macro traders in the world, he was telling me that Citadel, one of the best asset managers, they do psychological tests for all of their senior executives. And they're actually looking for that fine line of psychological issues where they're not too fucked up or they're just crazy and they're not too comfortable. You gotta find that perfect mix of being stable and have a chip on their shoulder. The right level of stubbornness and the right level of open-mindedness and the right level of needing to prove themselves. So to really cap off Patrick's point here, it's insufficient just to want to self-improve. Yes, you can compound to exactly his point, the quarter million dollar a year range, but to really, really be the best in the field to become a billionaire, you gotta have some demons inside you. This demon side of us is not just Patrick or just myself. It's literally every single hundred millionaire, billionaire, world-changing, world-dreaming type person that I come across and do business with. Everyone has enough, but they're just something that motivates them to want more. I don't know if it's healthy or psychologically normal to want this, but I think it is something that we should be self-aware about and talk about more. All right, we got the next one here. Hi, Justin, help me. I am 45 years old, no job, no friends, no money, that with no hobbies, what should I do? I'd enjoy the rest of your life, bro. I don't mean to be a dick, but if you've gotten to 45 and you have no friends, no money, living on welfare, and you're overweight, then me giving you advice in front of all these young men, I think is quite foolish of me. You let it pass you by. There's nothing I can do to help you. And that's just scare the out of every one of you young guys. Don't end up like this. And if you do, it's on you. It's your fault. Nobody else. This is his. All right, Justin, you look like you're also 45 and you're talking to this guy who spent his money, his time looking up to you, asking you for advice and just shit on his entire life. Be better. If you are in a position of privilege, a position of success, yes, you can go shit on people, but why do that? You, you clearly are a man child yourself where you need to punch down. If you are successful as you claim to be, you should say, hey, I'm also 45. And if you look at the number of billionaires like KFC, that colonel, 
He started KFC when he was in his 50s. So it is never too late to start changing your life today. Whether you're 45, 55, 85, or 15. The average life expectancy in America for a man, hey, say 70, 80 years old. This gentleman has 35 more years of life to go, which is infinite time to make something interesting, making something meaningful, to change the impact of his community around him. So Justin, you're a fucking asshole. You look like you're fucking 45. You have the same amount of lifespan as this guy. Be better. If you're actually successful, you're gonna bring people up, not punch people down. I don't know why I see this guy so much on freaking in on, on, on social media. I'll give you a compliment. It's interesting in terms of all these viral clips. You're doing something right, and there's something I can learn in terms of what you're doing with your social media bots that potentially could help my channel and get my message, which I think is superior, smarter, more benevolent than punching people down. All right, next one. And I'm built different, period. I rarely go out. And I always felt like if other cats was out partying and I was home studying, I would have an edge. But like, I'm literally like, all right, I will party later. I work hard now, so the second half of my life, I can do whatever the fuck I want. Mm. That's 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 been my men mentality. It's like I'm not going to trick off my early years for partying and then worry about struggling, how I'm going to make it, how I'm going to take care of my family, how I'm going to take care of everybody else. Like that's not going to be me. I'm going to grind it out now. You know what I'm saying I'm going to set up the foundation so I can enjoy myself later. That's always been my mentality. I like Michael B's message here. I actually had dinner with him at Zero Bond in New York City during the pandemic. So. Really cool to see him talk to talk, but also just seeing him in action where that dinner was a bunch of entrepreneur tech founders and Michael B as an entertainer, actor, producer, was trying to pick our brains in terms of venture capital, starting businesses, investing in businesses. And uh, we're actually co-investors in a couple of businesses together. So really cool to see that he's not just capping to the camera about grinding and not partying, but actually just seeing a little bit of a snapshot of his life that he's actually putting the work, learning from other people, other experts outside his domain, but wanting to learn, wanting to level himself up. Yeah, I think the cool thing that relates to me responding to Patrick Bet David is that Michael B has an absolute demon inside his head. For all intents and purposes, this guy is one of the most ca attractive, charismatic, famous people in the world, hundreds of millions of dollars in the bank, producing hit movies, one of the most recognizable people on the, on the face of the planet. But he still has a chip on the shoulder and he wants to put in the grind. He wants to be quiet and plot how he's gonna defeat and conquer everyone else while they're out partying and drinking and messing up their lives. He is studying, he is building, he is crafting. And again, I think that for people to truly break out, you need to have that psychological demon inside you that you want more, you want to be better. Even though from outside lens, Many people will say that he's done, he's, he's accomplished it all. I think in, in this world where people are inauthentic and just talking about how hard we're working, but they're not actually working, it's really cool to see Michael be in action and living what he's preaching. Got a 585 on my SAT, confessions. <laughs> I didn't even take mine. I got a perfect 1600 on my SAT, and I got a 1590 when I was in eighth grade. They give you 400 for putting your name on the paper. It's a true story. Wow. I guessed A-B-A-C-A-D-A. -A -A. I did abacadabba all the way back. <laughs> True story. I swear to God. <laughs> Hand on my mother's grave. A-B-A-C-A-D-A. -A -A. All the fun. way down. I didn't care because it was a class trip that same day. I wanted to go Great Adventure. <laughs> I was told that not taking my SAT seriously would prohibit me from furthering myself in life. That's what I was told. At the moment, I said, damn, maybe I should have Maybe I should have applied myself. Maybe I should have did different. When I saw all my friends get their test scores back and they were ecstatic, 800s, 900s, 960s, everybody's going to college. I felt like the biggest idiot in the fucking world. The biggest idiot in the fucking world because the same people that I went and rushed to go to Great Adventure with, they had taken their SAT the week before. They already got their work done. Mm. Kevin's story here really hits home to me in, in my own personal way. I remember when I was a sophomore, I was really good at chemistry and I competed in the chemistry Olympiad and I crushed the first round. So I was invited to, I think like the top 300 in the nation, which would then have a second competition to compete for the US chemistry camp, which is the top 20 chemistry students in the United States to select, I think the four or six top students to compete in the International Chemistry Olympia, the ICO. I remember that me and this kid, Miles, we were the two students from our school that made it to the next round. We were the top 300 or so 
chemistry students in all of America. I thought, hey, like, I'm pretty good. This is good enough for me. I'm not gonna apply myself. I thought it was like too hard for me to be the top 20. I didn't even like like chemistry that much. I think I just had good talent, good, good skill set, good basic prep to get to that level. But like, hey, did I wanna be like a chemistry professor? No. So I was like, hey, I'm not gonna study. And I think part of this test was actually doing lab experiments. I mean, you do, doing chemical reactions, having lab notebooks, testing how gases would emit off of chemical reactions and calculating all of the exact chemical reactions. I remember kind of going to a little bit blind. And then a few weeks later, when the results came out, my friend Miles made national camp. He was a top 20 chemistry student. You know, we were friends. We were about the same level. And I felt a regret of not applying myself because I thought that one, I didn't care about it. Two, I didn't think it was possible. But when I saw my classmate, Miles, actually made camp. And I think with that, he was able to go to MIT and he's doing a, a, a great career now. I was like, like, it will never let that happen to me again, where I had the opportunity, just like Kevin had the opportunity to just apply himself to take this seriously and achieve his goals. I think that punch the gut has really changed my approach to every single opportunity that I'm given today. I never want to feel the regret of having an opportunity, having a shot for great greatness, and then tapping myself out. If I'm gonna lose, I am happy to lose on a fair battlefield, but I will never count myself out before I go on that competition ground ever again. It sounds like Kevin took that to heart and has turned into one of the biggest entertainers in the world. And I hope that I can take that same analogous lesson into my life, <laughs> into my little sophomore year of chemistry uh, uh, venture so I never tap myself out ever again. It's something that I think we all have the viscerally to learn. I don't think you can watch this video or watch Kevin Hart's little anecdote to Joe Rogan to change your life. Maybe it's a little of a kickstart to see if there's any anecdotes in your own life that can build that little psychological trauma or that edge that you can apply for your dreams. This just reminds me of a Jeff Bezos framework, which is regret minimization. When you're 80, when you look back, you want to minimize the regrets that you have in your life. Not applying yourself when you have a shot is one of those things that we're always going to regret. So never regret applying yourself, taking that shot, losing honorably in the battlefield versus not even trying to compete in the first place. All right, next one. Facebook ran for seven years pre-revenue, not pre-profit, pre-revenue, which means they ran for seven years not selling anything to anyone. Amazon is now the world's largest retailer by market capitalization. It's been around for 15 years. For the first 13 years of Amazon's existence, it made losses. As a person who runs a business, I know when you have a loss at the end of the year, it's funded from two places, shareholders funds or debt. So who was funding Amazon's losses? Somebody funded it for 13 years, even though it wasn't making money. We just are not getting the message. You don't need a state funding agency. What you need is a hundred venture capitalists, each of them with a hundred million, and each of them willing to exit deals to each other. Beth will start a business. I'll fund her for two years. She still won't be profitable. She'll do another capital corner and I won't want to participate, but I will know that he does. So I'll call him and I say, I've got a deal. I've funded it for two years. It's now at less risk because it's been running for two years. Fund it. And then number three, number four, number five, by the time they get to the seventh or eighth iteration of the funding round, it's now running and it's a profitable business. This guy, I don't really know his background, but I think he is the guy who typifies knowing enough to be dangerous. First of all, I think the impression that if I was 25 and just trying to learn venture capital, that I would think that there is just a line of venture capitalists that are going to fund my unprofitable money losing business for eight years until I suddenly figure out how to make money. And that's just fundamentally wrong, especially when he conflates Facebook to Amazon's. Facebook not generating revenue for seven years and then comparing to Amazon, which was generating revenue from day one because it was an online bookstore, but not being profitable. So we got to just fully disambiguate and be very, very clear. Amazon was generating revenue day one. Bezos, very, very smart guy. He realized the internet was growing really, really fast and he could sell books online. So each book he was selling was making Amazon money. The difference is that he had such a good predictable business model that he could convince investors to say, hey, I'm not gonna generate profits and dividend capital. I'm gonna reinvest all the profits that I have from selling books and to selling everything. I'm gonna sell cameras, I'm gonna sell computers, I'm gonna sell phones, I'm gonna sell peanut butter, I'm gonna sell uh, vlogging lights. And then he realized, hey, I'm making even more money. I could distribute profits and dividends 
but no, I'm going to invest into warehouses so I can do Amazon Prime where I can send things to your door in one or two days. And that was very profitable once he started getting that infrastructure. Could I still generate profits and issue dividends? No, I'm going to take and can tell my investors, no, we're going to take all those profits and then invest in the cloud infrastructure. We're going to build Alexa. We're going to build streaming services. And now AWS, which is the cloud services, which basically powers every single site is probably running on an Amazon server. That's mega valuable. So this gentleman doesn't understand that Bezos is not running a company that was just unprofitable because it was a shitty business. He was a savage and ruthlessly investing unit economic positive cash flows into valuable infrastructure that would make more money in the long term. That is very different from saying, hey, I'm just a random guy running a random small business and I'm losing money every single year with no direction to compound that into infrastructure, into assets that will actually make me mo more money. And that's not even talking about Facebook, where Facebook is also a very, very different, distinct business model, where Facebook is a social media platform, a content media channel, which is all about selling advertising. So Facebook, Zuckerberg, realized that all he needed to do was get a billion plus people on his platform and he can then he could sell ads against it. Any premature monetization of selling ads to eyeballs would have hurt his app growth. So again, a very, very different strategic play. So for this guy, it's not about convincing venture capitalists to be bag holders for you. We're savage, we're capitalists, we're gonna make money every single round along the way. So don't get confused when he's saying, hey, you just need to convince some bag holder VC to pay you to keep your shitty business afloat. Completely, completely wrong lesson to take from him. My advice is make a profitable business day one. If you are losing money, you have to really understand why are you losing money? I am not going to go throw my good money after into your money burning pit. That is not my business model, nor should be your business model. That should not be the expectation. That's where I think so much of the business gurus go wrong because they think that you just got to go beg VCs for money and then you got it. No, make a business model that day one is profitable. And then if you want to invest faster, you can go raise money, you can go raise debt, but you need to be very strategic and smart on why that money losing play is going to make you more money in the immediate, short, medium, long term. We do not have that answered. You're just a money losing proposition and I'm out. Shark Tank offer, no. Yeah, so this guy, you know a little bit to do damage to lead people astray. I actually understand the nuances of what venture capital, what business formation is actually about. 90% of millionaires make it in real estate. 99% of billionaires make it in private equity. Mm. So exciting. real estate is where you go to establish a multi-million dollar foundation. But if you want to be bigger than that, you don't do real estate. Real estate is a foundation that you build on top of. And honestly, Jerry, I, I think I figured it out too late. I'm trying to get that word out to as many people as possible saying like real estate is a stepping stone and it's a start. And maybe you're watching and thinking, hey, when I've got four or five million dollars, I'm set. I'm good. I earn 10% on that. I can live off a half a million dollars a year. I'm a happy dude. And you know what? Happy for you. There are some of us out here, and this is my personal take, is that the moment you stop pushing yourself to grow, you're dead. Yeah. You're dying. You're downhill. I mean, like a lot of people send me this guy. And again, I think this guy's another one of those guys who just knows a little bit to be dangerous. One love a stat check on this. I'm not going to waste my time looking at how people make their money, but I'll guarantee you that 90% of people that are millionaires are not making it through being a real estate professional. Look, there's so many literally lawyers, doctors, software engineers are making 250, 500, upwards of money as a year, they ain't, they ain't making it there. I mean, if you have like a white collar professional jobs making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, within 10 years, you do some reasonable savings, you'll be a millionaire, right? So no, I think just from at, at, at first glance, like consultant brain being like, does that just pass a snip test of population statistics? Nah, dude, you're full of shit. And then from a 99% of billionaires are private equity. I have so many friends that work in private equity and the only billionaires that come out of private equity are actually the founders of said private equity business. They're really entrepreneurs at heart. If you think about the best private equity firms, Schwarzman at Blackstone, Orlando Bravo at Tomo Bravo, the Carlisle guys, Rubenstein, they're all billionaires because they founded 
an investment private equity company. If you're a VP, associate, an analyst at these firms, you're not a billionaire. And it's just the same thing as a Facebook or a Tesla or a Amazon. If you started a massive, massive business providing services to their customers, a private equity firm is really just a business too. They sell investment financial products to investors to go compound their money and they take a cut along the way. So real estate, running a tech company, right? Running a private equity fund have a lot more in common than what people like him want you to believe. The definition of private equity is that it's a stock in a company that's not publicly traded. So I'm a startup guy. I have a lot of private equities, but do I consider myself a private equity professional? No, because private equity is simply raising money from investors, LPs, taking that money to buying companies, and you're a smarter business operator than the original founders of that company. So you're gonna apply your best practices of cutting costs, helping with distribution, maybe buying smaller companies to add accretive EBITDA to that company. You try to get some EBITDA multiple expansion because you're choosing a fast growing market and you flip it for money in three to five years. It's not magic, it's financial engineering, a little bit of operational know-how and a little bit about choosing the right markets at the right time. Not 99% of billionaires are like that. I would say that 99% of billionaires are actually entrepreneurs that have made a business and have compounded it over many, many, many years, right? Of course, there's the tech entrepreneurs, the Zuckerbergs, the Musks, the Bezoses that are very, very visible. But I know so many billionaires and their families had run like the largest plumbing network, or they own a lot of farmland, or they are a shipping company and they move boats around and move ships around. All these unsexy, boring businesses that manage multi-billion dollar assets. So I don't even know why this clip got viral because he's stating things that aren't actually true. And there's not really a takeaway other than, hey, real estate is pretty good and private equity is cooler. That, that's the sentiment I get from this conversation. Business is actually pretty simple. Real estate is about buying an asset that generates cash flow and hopefully that equity appreciates over time. That's literally the same thing as buying a business, right? You hopefully you buy a business that generates cash flow and hopefully that equity appreciates over time. And of course, you can fix up the house, you can fix up the rental income, you can maybe make multiple units or add a hot tub, you can rent it out for more. We're gonna do the same thing with a business. You fire a lazy HR person, offshore your engineers, uh, cut your salespeople, and buy some companies to jack up EBITDA. Same business, same level of work. Don't be fooled by his language and his parlance. It's pretty clear he doesn't really understand what private equity and what real estate people actually do. I think this guy kind of personifies the type of person that knows a little bit to be dangerous, to lead you on the wrong direction. But clearly when you dig in a couple layers deep, he doesn't really know what he's talking about. And I venture that, again, I don't know who he is, but I bet you this guy's trying to sell you some financial management courses. And let's look up his page. What's his name? Chris Krohn. And uh, I predicted it. He's selling you books and he's selling you some boot camps. What'd I tell you? If they don't got it, they sell you some f***ing bullshit course to pretend they got it. A lot of these people out there, guys, be careful. I highly suggest as you guys are coming towards the end of your meal, either you or her will go to the restroom. If she goes to the restroom, square away the bill very quickly. If you know that you're done with your meal, you're not going to order anything else or vice versa. If you go to the restroom at the end of the meal, just square away the bill while you're going to the restroom. And once again, this is another era of effortlessness. There is no bill at the end. You fumbling for your wallet, trying to pay, trying to maintain conversation while that's happening. Now, I know there might be a very small subsection of you that are going wait but if i do that how do we split the bill if you are still the sort of guy that thinks you should go on a date and split the bill with a woman please just unsubscribe to my channel you don't belong here you belong in the kitty sand pit playing with the other children you are not a man i think it's just touching on a social cultural moment that is in discussion every day today i, I think we're having a live discussion around the place of men and women society a lot of traditional values has this notion of the man being the breadwinner and the woman being the partner that takes care of the household and more of the soft components of 
a nuclear family. And it's been very interesting in the over the last 50 years as feminism has empowered women to be direct contributors to capitalism that they're just fully empowered. And in, in, in a lot of sense, women are just actually doing better than young men today. If you look at college graduation rates, uh, number of friends, mental health, young women are actually doing much, much better than young men who are dropping out. They're not having friends. They're not dating. I'm not claiming that I have the solution, nor am I suggesting, hey, you're a man, pay the bill, or you're a woman, you should be taken out. I think that's an individual choice thing. You know, I have my personal preference of how I would like to take my partner out. I think you can make your own decision. But I think he is talking more towards broader cultural question that we as a society need to figure out. You know, all my thought here is that like I'm very American, very libertarian here, which is that you choose what life you want to live. You choose what values you want. We have freedom of speech, freedom of pursuit of our own happiness. So if you're looking for more of a 50-50 type relationship, great. If you're looking for more of a traditional man is a leader of the household, woman is more of a supporting of the household, great. But I think that really it should be a conversation of that dating relationship. What type of tenor? And it can evolve over time. So I think for Amon, it feels like he's just trying to pretend to be this alpha masculine bro, which is like, hey, if you're broke, you can't date woman, get your money game up. I get it, right? Like you have more resources, you can uh, provide a better life experience for your wife or your spouse. Cool. But I'm not going to be here in a position of having some success to be like, hey, you're a fucking failure. You don't deserve to date woman. No, Amon, you can be better than that. Help lift people up not punch down. Having started software businesses before, my biggest piece of advice here is that you need to have a software co-founder. You need somebody who's a technical co-founder who will work day and night, somebody who loves code, loves making products that people love. If you don't have that person and it's like a third party shop or you're paying, I can count on like one hand the amount of companies that have succeeded that way versus having a technical co-founder. If you're trying to do this on the side, the likelihood that you really get to something that's massive is really low. The guys you're competing against, because there are guys who are probably looking at the same industry, building a product right now that does the same thing, they're well capitalized and they're savages. They don't have side hustle it's their main hustle this is for my engineering brothers and sisters out there don't be the technical co-founder to some idea guy be the founder if you actually think about it i'm an engineer by background and i'm not looking for a technical co-founder i am the founder and if you actually look at mark zuckerberg elon musk jeff bezos the best entrepreneurs these guys all had technical engineering deep physics backgrounds if you're just an idea guy why don't you think of yourself as the marketing or the go-to-market co-founder. Hormozy, if I uh, know his background correctly, is not technical, right? He ran a gym consulting business to start his career. My advice is for the engineers out there, don't rely on some marketing MBA guy to like be your CEO. You should aspire to be that CEO because as Hormozy rightly identifies, the engineering counterpart has all the leverage. You are the scarce resource that makes a software company actually work not the marketing guy. It's way easier to learn how to do marketing or how to do a business model or learn a sales program than learning how to code. Don't constrain yourself. You already mastered the hard part. The easy part is hiring some salespeople. So flip the script, guys. Engineering number one, physics number one, marketing lower on the totem pole. You can be like me. I think I got pretty good at marketing and talking and selling because I am confident that I can outsmart, be more technical, than any MBA out there. Don't get bamboozled by the slick talkers because you can get better at selling. You look at Zuckerberg. I just remember his first interview on the big stage when he was in his 20s. It was so freaking awkward. And he was like sweating bullets because uh, this reporter, Kara Swisher, was busting his balls. And now, look, I, I wouldn't say he's like the most fucking charismatic person ever, but he's pretty presentable. He's actually grown to be quite a good salesperson and a marketer. That should be the path for you. Don't play second fiddle when you have the goods to be first fiddle. The biggest advice I could give you right now, the biggest advice that anybody could give you, and this is not my words. Woody Allen told me this. He said, I said, Woody, what's the secret to success? He said, 85 to 90% of life is just showing up. Show up. If you show up, there's a chance something could happen. Yeah, uh, look, I think that's a trope that we've all heard. Hey, life is about showing up. But I think we can get more sophisticated, more nuanced about it. It's not just showing up. It's 
necessary but insufficient. I think a better analogy, a better frame is talking about increasing your surface area to collect block. I have some friends who go to the LA club scene because they show up to go meet with the high rollers that are buying all the tables and buying all the bottles. And they're like, hey, I am showing up to network with all these successful business people. And it's like, is that really showing up? Like some rich business guys want to go out in LA and you hang out with them on a weekend when everyone's getting drunk. Is that generating luck? Maybe, but that's not the actual surface area in which context is being made. If I meet you at a club, am I going to look at you as like a serious business partner? Probably not, right? Like I'm not looking for party friends. I'm looking for people that are experts in the craft. So showing up, I think is the wrong advice because I think it just leads you to just be a clout chaser to be in, the, in, 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 a, in a room. I actually prefer bringing hard skills, knowledge to the room. So when you just say, hey, just show up and, and just be in people's faces, I actually don't like that. I, I don't like when people are just in my face just selling me shit. I like people that bring me unique insights, unique knowledge, unique skill set because, hey, I can learn something from you. I pride myself of having just really good information flow. I know a lot from a lot of smart people. So to have you add something to my life, there's got to be something new that you bring to the table. My tweak to the advice of just showing up is, yeah, you gotta show up. You gotta show up with some goods. You gotta show up with something interesting. I've been in rooms when I had really nothing to offer because I just didn't really have any skills or any knowledge that was useful to all the billionaires in the room. And I hated that feeling. So I built skills, I built values, I built insights that I could share. That's what you should optimize for, right? Build unique set of skills and knowledge and insights that successful people can actually partner with you on. That's how you unlock success and unlock luck. Being a coattail hanger in the room probably actually like lowers your value in my opinion. I became a millionaire by 26 years old and here are the three biggest things I learned about money. Number one is the famous quote that it takes money to make money is real and it has to do a lot with your abundant mindset. Instead of being super scarce with your money and holding it to yourself and letting it sit there, you have to utilize your money to be able to make it work for you. So what that ultimately means is you need to go spend your money. Uh, yes. I really understand the blue collar immigrant mindset of scarcity versus abundance mindset. My parents were immigrants. My mom had escaped communist China and my dad came here to be a physics student at UCLA. So I understand the scarce frugal mindset, but I think it's still a conversation that I have with my dad around use money to make money. I've seen the most sophisticated, Ivy League educated Wall Street, Silicon Valley folks who really maximize that game, right? Like having the money to show image, to put on the front, to then make more money. There's a balance to these things, right? Like I don't think you go crazy scarce mindset, you don't also go crazy loud mindset. You need to know when to choose your spots. I think that's where wisdom and taste come into play. You need to know when to show and when to be frugal. I think I'm trying to hold that balance, right? Like I know when I need to show out and I know when it's a waste of money, but yeah, still finding that line for me personally. Number two is the money you spend doesn't always have to have a return on your investment. It doesn't always have to mean that if you spend $5,000, you got to get $5,000 back. Sometimes you need to spend your ROI just on your happiness. So if it gives you a good return on your happiness and makes you happy, it's worth spending on. You can always make more money, but you can never make your time back. Maybe this is arrogant of me to say, but spending money on lifestyle or travel or food doesn't change my budget. Like that just doesn't hit my bank account. Anything less than you know, few thousand dollars. This is just doesn't like register. So sure. I think a lot of my attention is focused on the seven, eight, nine figure plays where really good focus on ROI pays off, you know, a thousand X fold. Then like, Hey, I'm trying to save two bucks to go to the gas station at Costco versus the, uh, the seven 11 right next door. Or like, Hey, buy this plane ticket or that vacation or this meal or that meal. I mean, I think the only thing I can react to here is that and I think there's so many like successful friends that I have, especially from like a kind of an immigrant mindset, which is that they would go drive an extra 30 minutes to save 10 cents on a gallon of gasoline, which if you have like an average tank, it's like 20 gallons a tank. So 20 times 10 cents is literally two bucks. So you're going to value your time of 30 minutes for $4 an hour. I've been just trying to educate like folks to just be like, look, like four bucks, eight bucks, 10 bucks doesn't change your life. 
like you make way more than that, don't sweat it. If you actually have to focus your energy on like the larger strategic decisions, that will be seven, eight, nine figure decisions. And number three is spend your money or else the government will. This applies to everyone who has a business. If you're not spending your money on your business and using it as write-offs as any way you can, you're going to end up paying it to the government anyways. So don't be stingy. Use your money for your business as much as possible. That one is like, I think the most, I feel like a lot of business growers like talk about this, which is like, hey, go buy the G-Wagon so you can write it off. Or like, hey, go buy this expensive thing so you can go write it off. I think you just be really, really careful with these types of things because tax law is complicated. Write-offs are complicated. You get too clever, it could really bite you in the butt. But of course, I mean, I agree the general principle that as business people, we want to be as efficient with our capital as possible. And there is some role of paying into the government through taxation because our government provides all the safety and, and, and the baseline rule of law that we all need. But I, think, but I think it's a larger point. I think it's like an important topic that I hope to talk about more, which is that sometimes and I think we're getting to, to that is that the government is a government in a bureaucracy in a corpo environment in of itself and forgot its original purpose to serve the people. And I think a lot of government spending is wasteful. I mean, you just see how much money that is being sent overseas, how much money that's spent on various programs. And it's like, wow, you know, these people are stroking billion dollar checks, hundred billion dollar checks, like they're nothing. Can you imagine that if you put a billion dollars, a hundred billion dollars into my hands or any reasonable business owner, that is counting every single penny, creating value, generating ROI on every single investment, how much more good they can do. I believe that taxes are a necessary component to having a society. I wanna up level the intelligence of our government so that money is well spent. But yeah, I think in terms of just like, I think the guy's last point here, you gotta be careful with like these tax schemes. I think you can really fuck yourself if you get too fucking creative. Awesome, that was fun. Uh, keep sending me clips. I, I really generally find this fun because it's just like new stimulation for me to respond and react to. I feel like this is me freestyling. This is my uh, battle rap. Part of me is like, yo, I wanna just battle rap any business guru. Let's fucking go off the dome. We can just get some lines and prompts and let's rap against each other and see who's smarter, who's actually got the goods. This is fun for me. So send me your clips, send me things you want me to respond to. Please like, comment, subscribe if you enjoy this. We're really gonna be focused on my YouTube. I'll see you guys next time. Peace out, guys.